Uh, today, what I want to talk to you about is, as Mark said, the flip side of the sugar story. Carolyn Bertozzi talked to you about glucose, how glucose can uh, be uh, attached to proteins uh, on the surface of cells and allow for cell-to-cell -cell communication, very important in endocrinology, and we care about that. But what we're going to talk today about is where sugars go wrong, as it were. You know, sugar's gone wild. Uh, and that is uh, very specifically the compound fructose. And we're going to talk about what it does, what it doesn't do, and its relationship to health. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, have just enough science to keep you interested and hopefully a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, popular stuff to, to make it uh, fun. First of all, I have no disclosures, no food industry concern is putting me up to this. So this is the past, 2001. Six million kids are seriously overweight. Well, in the last 12 years, with all of the attention to obesity, with all the NIH money, with all of the research and programs that have gone on around the country and around the world, with Michelle Obama's vegetable gardens, we are now up to 20 million. <laughs> Here's the present. Currently, there are 30% more obese people on the planet than there are undernourished people. This is a complete switch from just 15 years ago when it was the other way around. And this is in countries that still have malnutrition. They now have obesity. This makes no sense. It actually looks more like an exposure like an infectious disease epidemic than it does anything else. 366 million diabetics walking the earth, that's 5% of the world's population, and they are chewing through all the healthcare dollars. And this is a problem, and it's a problem for me, and it's a problem for you. And it will be a bigger problem for you in the future. This just came out two months ago. Diabetes costs the US $245 billion a year. If we could recoup even part of that, we could actually fix health care. We could actually make a big dent in the federal budget. And that's just for diabetes, never mind all the other chronic metabolic diseases, such as heart disease, cancer, dementia, and things that are related to the obesity epidemic, which we call metabolic syndrome. And this is the future. If nothing happens, if we just keep doing what we're doing, 165 million Americans will be obese by 2030. That will be 42% of the U.S. population. 100 million Americans will have diabetes by 2050. That will be 33%. And so that means no health care for you because Medicare will be broke by the year 2024. That's just 11 years from now. Well, I'm going to turn 67 in 2024, and I want my Medicare. And I hope you do too because some of you are already paying into it probably with your summer jobs. You will never see that money again unless we do something. The question is what? Now, to understand obesity, we have to understand the fact that there's a reason for obesity. This is an 11-inch statue that currently lives in the Vienna Museum of Natural History. It carbon dates back to 22,000 BC. And what it shows us, it's called the Venus von Willendorf, and it, what it shows us is that the ancients knew about obesity before they knew about McDonald's. Obesity is part of the human condition. There are reasons for obesity. It actually helps promote storage for a rainy day, and we've had a lot of rainy days in our history. There are 60 different medical diagnoses, if you pull out a uh, textbook of medicine or, or endocrinology that contribute to obesity or cause obesity. And so the fact that obesity has been with us for millennia is, should be no surprise. The question is, what happened in the last 30 years? You have lived through this. You have been part of this. You know that this is going on in your schools. And despite the fact that all of this attention is being paid to this problem, Nothing seems to happen. The statistics just seem to get worse. How did this happen and how did it happen so fast? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, to understand obesity, first you have to understand this law of physics, right? The first law of thermodynamics, which states that the total energy inside a closed system remains constant. 
Now, that's a law. I believe in the first law. The first law is sacrosanct. The first law is airtight. If I didn't believe in the first law, you'd have ride me out on a rail and call me a, an idiot and an heretic and a zealot and whatever else. The point is that like any law, there are different interpretations. Ask the Supreme Court. Since everything's five to four, I've learned all about that in my uh, law school studies. There is no Supreme Court decision that isn't five to four. That means that there are different interpretations of the same law. Well, I'm going to give you the two interpretations of this law right, right now. And we're going to see which one makes more sense. So this is the first interpretation. The one I learned way back when, the one you've learned. If you eat it, you better burn it, or you're going to store it. Now, who here believes that? Come on, come on, come on, come on. All of you. Right. Everyone and his brother has told you that this is the case. The NIH, the U.S. Surgeon General, the Institute of Medicine, the President, Michelle Obama, and the food industry have all said, if you eat it, you better burn it, or you're going to store it. In which case, the obesity that's over here is a result of too much in, gluttony, not enough out, sloth. Two behaviors. Obesity is the result of behavior. And this works for the administration. It works for the food industry. It works for the insurance industry. Because if it's a behavior, it's your fault. And if it's your fault, they don't have to pay. Because if it were anything else, and they had to pay, it would break the bank. So everyone is lined up on the side of this interpretation of the first law. And it's based on this dogma. A calorie is a calorie. That you can get your calories from carrots, or you can get your calories from cheesecake. If you eat more calories than you burn, you will gain weight. That's a calorie is a calorie. That's the dogma. And anybody who goes against that dogma is considered a heretic and a zealot. Well, guess what? I'm going against it. The corollaries to this dogma are, this is free will. You get to choose what you eat. You get to choose how much you eat. It's personal responsibility. When that donut is staring at you, you don't have to eat it, right? And it's your choice to do so, and therefore, it's your responsibility. Therefore, if you're obese, it's gluttony and sloth. After all, the obese are the last group of people that we can still make fun of. Right? Just turn on Jay Leno any given night, and at least one-eighth of the jokes are about obesity. And finally, it must be about diet and exercise. Because if you eat less and you exercise more, you'll lose weight. And everybody knows somebody where they've been able to be successful. One person. Problem is, we have many people, most people, who are not successful. And the question is, why? Because they are gluttons and sloths because they don't have enough intestinal fortitude, they don't have enough backbone? Is that what this is really about? This is going on all over the world. The Japanese are beating the pants off us in terms of you know, uh, knowledge and you know, where, where their high school students are, not you guys, but you know, in general, the, uh, the, the, the level of their uh, high school students. But they're doing bariatric surgery at Tokyo Children's right now. Something's going on, something bigger than this. And we're going to talk about it. So what is it? Is it just a caloric bacchanalia? We're all just awash in this stuff? Uh, wait, this is wrong. That's much better. OK. Indeed, we are all eating more, no argument. American men are eating 187 calories a day more than 25 years ago. Adult women, 335 calories a day more than 25 years ago. And teen boys. 275 calories more per day than 25 years ago. Agreed, we are all eating more. The question is why? Well, this would be the obvious answer, right? This is what fast food has turned into. This was the original White Castle hamburger back in 1957 when I was born. One ounce, 210 calories. This is Bob's big boy over here at six ounces, and that's 618 calories. And in the midst of the obesity epidemic, 
parties had the temerity to or, uh, uh, bring on the thick burger at 1,420 calories, and everybody knows that Carl's Jr. has the $6 burger, which is 2,000 calories. So you'd say, well, there you go. That's obesity right there. Anybody had a Trenta? Okay, there's a Trenta right over there, okay? 916 cc's, okay? And that's not black coffee. That's a sugar-sweetened beverage, right? Because it's cold, right? Your stomach is 900 cc's. It's bigger than your stomach. Now, Mayor Bloomberg in New York has tried to institute the big gulp ban, and the judge in New York struck it down on the basis of free, freedom of choice, personal responsibility, and all that other stuff. It'll be appealed, and we'll see where it goes. And I've learned a lot about that in law school, and we can talk about that at the end if you like. How about this? Free delicious sandwich with the purchase of a 30-ounce drink. Has the food gotten so cheap that we're giving it away now? Or is it the other side of the equation? Is it an activity famine? Kids aren't exercising very much anymore. So this is a measure of physical activity called met times, how much you exercise. And this is white kids, and the, uh, white girls, and this is black girls ages 9 all the way up to 19. And you can see the black girls ages 15 to 19 are basically lying prostrate on the bed or the floor, not moving at all. So you'd say, well, there's your obesity right there. And that's exactly what everyone tells you is we eat too much, we exercise too little. And indeed, we do. The question is, why? Because the food is there, it was there before. Because the TV is there, it was there before. And we didn't have this caloric catastrophe. Something else is going on. Mark Twain said it best. Education consists mainly of what we have unlearned. Okay? There's only one dogma. There is no dogma. That's the dogma. Whatever we believed 10 years ago is already wrong. And whatever we believe today will be wrong 10 years from now. That's why we do research, is to advance the ball. Because if any dogma were true, that would be the end of research. There wouldn't be any need to do further research, would there? So all of you have to basically leave your dogma at the front door, and let's talk about what's really going on. All right? So behavior, personal responsibility. That's what you walked in with. Is that right? I have six reasons to doubt this. Here's the first. No child chooses to be obese. The quality of life of an obese child is the same as a child on cancer chemotherapy. You think anybody chooses that? You think anybody goes out and says, I think I'll be obese today? What's in it for any given kid to be obese? Now, maybe some adults choose to be obese. I don't know. But no kid does. Nobody will play with an obese kid. They've done these studies where they show pictures of deformed kids to other kids and say, which of these kids would you rather play with? And the obese kid is the kid that nobody wants to play with. So who would choose that? Second, does diet work? Everybody's diet works for the first six months. And then look what happens. Doesn't matter, very low calorie diet, with behavioral therapy, without behavioral therapy, by the end of five years, it's all back to the same baseline. And here's the number of patients who can keep their weight off for nine years or greater, about 1%. About one in 100 can keep their weight off for any length of time at all. Bottom line, diets work and they don't work. The question is why? Because there's more going on. Does exercise work? So this is the identity line right here. And here are a bunch of meta, is it a meta-analysis of a bunch of studies looking at whether exercise can allow you to burn off calories enough to actually lose weight? And the answer is no. When compared with no treatment, exercise resulted in very small changes in weight, a total of 0.5 BMI points. That ain't going to do it. But you say, if the first law was right, then you should lose weight, right? Doesn't work. Number three, this isn't about America. It's not about the UK, it's not about Australia, it's about everywhere. And every country on the planet has experienced an uptick in obesity 
over the last 10 years. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter who, doesn't matter what, doesn't matter genetics, nothing. Every country has seen it. So you're going to tell me everybody's a bunch of gluttons and sloths now? Number four, the poor are disproportionately affected. If you believe in personal responsibility, if you believe in free choice, then you have to have a choice. The poor don't have a choice. They can't buy reasonable foods. They don't even have grocery stores in their local neighborhoods. They have to go to convenience stores where it's all processed, high sugar, low fiber, processed foods. They don't have a choice. They, don't ha they can't diet and exercise. They can't even go out for fear of crime. They won't let their kids out because they might get shot. So if you don't have a choice, how can it be personal responsibility? Number five, the prevalence of obesity is going up in the group that can't accept personal responsibility, the toddler age group. You're going to tell me that a two-year-old can accept personal responsibility? And number six, the, the, the slam dunk, the in-your-face, we have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. They don't diet and exercise. So any hypothesis you want to proffer to me about what's causing the obesity epidemic has to explain obese six-month-olds. And you can't do it. Not on diet and exercise, you can't. Not on personal responsibility. Not on free will. Something else is going on. Have I got your attention? Good. So let's talk about this. Behavior, right? Personal responsibility, it's a behavior. It's gluttony and sloth. <clears throat> you get to choose, it's a behavior. Here's the definition of behavior. A stereotyped motor response to a physiological stimulus. So let's take that apart. Stereotype, same every time. So yes, eating is a behavior because it looks the same every time you do it. Motor, muscles have to move. A thought is not a behavior. And finally, physiological. That's the key one. Behavior is driven by biochemistry, always. Sometimes we're smart enough to figure out what the biochemistry is. Sometimes we're not. But the bottom line is behavior is always secondary to some change in brain chemistry or brain function. Behavior has a biochemical basis. And so when you understand that biochemistry, then obesity actually makes sense. And we're going to talk about that a little bit now. So what are the biochemical underpinnings of gluttony and sloth? What does the brain see that makes this happen? In this book, Food Fight, came out in 2004, Kelly Brownell, who is now the dean of public policy at Duke University, coined this term, the toxic environment. And what he was talking about were the behaviors that lead to obesity that are now promulgated basically throughout the United States. On the food side, we have food available 24, 7, 365, accessible as never before, sold in places unrelated to eating. Whoever heard of having dinner at a gas station, right? But you go on I-5, that's where you have dinner. Che unbelievably cheap, right? Promoted heavily, designed to taste really good to keep people eating. We'll talk about that in a minute. On the activity side, decreased walking and biking, little PE over across the bay in the San Francisco Unified School District. 80% of kids can't pass the phys ed exam in fifth grade. Why? Because you need a certificate to teach phys ed, but you don't need a certificate to teach. So the teachers have to pay for that themselves so they don't get it. So there are no teachers who can teach phys ed, so there's no phys ed. That's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, but that's what's going on. Little uh, screen time makes kids inactive. Yes, no, I don't know, that's a tough one. And parents, again, are reluctant to let their children out of the house for fear of crime. This is a disaster. All these things are true. The question is, is this the causative uh, piece? Is this what's going on? The toxic environment, as Brunel defines it, is really a euphemism for our altered behaviors. I'm more interested in whether or not there's really a toxin, a poison, that's actually driving the obesity epidemic. And I'm not the only one who thinks this, but I'm certainly one of the people who thinks this. So, we know that there are substances that are out there that are both addictive and hazardous to your health. And we regulate them because they're addictive and hazardous to your health. Tobacco, alcohol, other street drugs, 
right? Well, what I'm going to try to show you today is that this guy right over here, the stuff in that yellow package, the stuff that's in every processed food on purpose is killing you, slowly. Not fast, slow. Not one meal, but 10,000 over time. And that's what we're going to talk about. And this has been parlayed in the press quite a bit. This was in the New York Times Magazine back on two years ago, Sweet and Vicious is Sugar Toxic. And this was a Nature article that we published just last year that basically called for regulation. And I'll show you why and how. So let's talk about hazards to your health. It's all about whether or not that dogma, a calorie is a calorie, is correct. Because if a calorie is not a calorie, all hell breaks loose. Then the type of calories determine your metabolic fate. And that's indeed what's happening. So what I have to do is show you that the kind of calories you consume make a difference. That's what we're going to do. So yes, we're all eating more. Total caloric intake, 275 calories more in teen boys, like we talked about. What are they? Are they fat? Nope, they're not fat. Five grams, 45 calories. Basically, our fat con consumption has stayed pretty much constant over the last 30 years. Because we were told back in the early 1980s to reduce our percent consumption from fat from 40 to 30 percent. And guess what? We've done it with all the low-fat stuff that's out there because we were told to do it by the USDA, the AMA, the AHA. Everybody told us, get your fat down. Now, why did they tell us that? Heart disease. Try to prevent heart disease. Well, as that has occurred, the obesity and metabolic syndrome, diabetes prevalence, has just gone through the roof, as I've shown you. Nope, it's not the fat. What are we eating more of? Well, we're eating more carbohydrate. There it is right there, 57 grams, 228 calories. That's what we're eating more of. The low-fat craze drove this. Why? Because the content of low-fat home-cooked food that your mother makes, you can control that. You can control how much fat you put in something. But low-fat processed food tastes like cardboard. The flavor was in the fat. Okay? And if anybody doesn't understand that, just take, taste whole milk versus skim milk. Okay? Skim milk tastes like dishwater. Okay? And of course, the schools know that, so what do they do? Add the chocolate, right? Which carbohydrate? Either high fructose corn syrup, most demonized food additive known to man, or sucrose, which is ta table, uh, cane table sugar, you know, uh, beet sugar. And here's an example, snack wells. Two grams of fat down, 13 grams of carbohydrate up, <coughs> four of which are sugar. You gotta do something to make it taste good when you take the fat away, because otherwise no one will buy it. And then the food industry goes out of business. And indeed, which Carbohydrate, well, beverage intake, 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids. Just remember, one can of soda a day is 150 calories. That times 365 days a year, divide by the magic number of 3,500 calories in a pound. So each can of soda is worth 15 and a half pounds of fat per year. And we don't drink one can of soda in America, we drink 2.5. So there's a lot of calories. So what is this stuff? So here it is, right here. So everybody remembers glucose from Dr. Bertozzi's lecture? That's right over here, this six-membered ring right here. Glucose is not very interesting. It's a little sweet. It's not very sweet. Okay? You don't see people going around chugging Cairo syrup, do you? <laughs> Might be good in a pecan pie, but it's not very interesting. And you would never make like a soft drink out of it, would you? Because it's not very exciting. Yeah, it's sweet, but it's not fun. This stuff over here, though, is fun, okay? Fructose. Fructose is very sweet. Fructose on a sweetness index is 173 compared to glucose, which is 74, sucrose being 100. Everybody got it? This is the stuff we seek. This is the stuff we go out of our way for. This is the stuff that beckons us, and there are reasons why. Well, here's sucrose right over here, table sugar. One glucose, one fructose, an O-glycosidic linkage linking the two, the enzyme in your intestine called sucrase cleaves this in about a nanosecond. You absorb both. So bottom line, high fructose corn syrup up here, sucrose down here, they're the same. They're equal. They're equally bad. They're equally poisonous. And I will show you how and why. That's the problem. 
and it's everywhere. So here's what's happened to our consumption over the last 100 years. Our ancestors, 100 years ago, getting fruits and vegetables out of the ground with the occasional honey, consumed 15 grams of fructose per day. So that's half an ounce, double for sugar. So that's an ounce of sugar per day. And we could handle that just fine, no problem. Prior to World War II, we got up to about 20 grams of fructose per day with the nascent candy and soft drink industries in America. By 1977, before high fructose corn syrup invaded our shores, we were up to 37 grams a day, and that was 8% of our total caloric intake. By 1994, we were up to 55 grams a day, that was 10% of our total caloric intake. And currently, adolescents, you guys right here in this room, on average consume 75 grams of fructose per day, double that for sugar, 150 grams of sugar per day, multiply that by 4.1 calories per gram, that's 600 calories in sugar per day. And 25% of adolescents consume 100 grams of fructose per day. So that's 840 calories in sugar. That's 40% of calories as sugar. The question is, is that OK? Does that do something? Can you handle that? Can your liver handle that? That's the question for today. Is there a dose-response relationship? Paracelsus very famous scientist in the 1500s said, the dose determines the poison. We are overdosed. And the question is, how did we get overdosed? So does sugar cause obesity? If you look at this table right here, the worst foods are potato chips and french fries for obesity. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> Me too. Here's sugar. Sweets and desserts, sugar-sweetened beverages, they come in a distant third, okay? So, does sugar cause obesity? The answer is yes, it does. Here are, is a meta-analysis. Everybody knows what that is? It's a bunch of analyses uh, that have very specific criteria that uh, they are subjected to uh, statistically to determine whether or not, when they are all pooled together, whether they actually meet the criteria for, um, for significance. And the answer is yes. They do, right here. <clears throat> so sugar does promote weight gain, but not a lot. The BMI change on the, in the study was a total of 0 0.8, okay? And if you know anything about BMI, that's not a lot, okay? We've got a BMI disaster of about 7 to 8. So 0 0.8 is not a lot. So does sugar cause obesity? Well, it's one of the things. It's not the only thing. There are a lot of things that cause obesity. And that's one of the problems. It's because the food industry will say, well, wait, we're not guilty because there are so many different things that cause obesity. Because it's not about obesity. Obesity doesn't cost any money. Diabetes costs money. Heart disease costs money. Fatty liver disease costs money. Cancer costs money. Dementia costs money. Everybody got the picture? So don't let them talk about obesity anymore. Irrelevant. Let's talk about disease. Now, as far as I'm concerned, we've had our entire food supply fructosylated, right under our noses, for palatability, especially with decreased fat, and also ostensibly as a browning agent, because foods brown better when you add sugar. Go to the grocery store and go to the bread aisle and check out the 32 commercially available breads at Safeway. And look at the ingredients list. 31 of the 32 will have added sugar, ostensibly to promote browning. But really, the reason is because you like it a lot. And so you eat more of it. In addition, we've had the removal of fiber for shelf life and for freezing, because you can't freeze fiber. Go home, take an orange, put it in your freezer overnight, Take it out the next day, put it on the counter, thaw it, try to eat it, see what you get. What do you get? You get mush. You get mush. Why do you get mush? The ice crystals form inside the cell wall, damage the cell wall, macerate the cell wall, so that when you thaw it, all the water rushes in, turns it to mush. Food industry knows that. But when you squeeze it and freeze it, it lasts forever. You've taken a fruit called orange, and you've turned it into a commodity 
called frozen concentrated orange juice, which you can sell on the open market and make money on because there's no depreciation. In addition, a lot of the pro uh, um, uh, entitlement programs like food stamps will give you money for juice but not for fruit. And that's on purpose because fruit is expensive and juice is cheap. The point is the fructose is not glucose because a calorie is not a calorie. The common wisdom is that sugar is just empty calories. And we all get discretionary calories. And we could use them on anything we want. And we do. And then some. But if sugar is not just empty calories, if sugar were, say, toxic calories and actually did something bad to you, then we've got a different paradigm, don't we? Because a calorie is not a calorie. So what's different? Well, liver fructose metabolism is completely different from that of glucose. Chronic fructose exposure promotes all the diseases that I talked to you about, and I'm going to show you that in very gory detail. Second, fructose tricks the brain into increasing total consumption because fructose does not get logged by the brain as having eaten. If you take a kid and you give them a can of soda 150 calories, and then you let them loose at the fast food restaurant, do they eat less or do they eat more? They eat more. How come they eat more? Because the 150 calories didn't get logged by the brain as even having eaten. There's a hunger hormone in your stomach called ghrelin that goes to your brain and tells you you're hungry. You put soda in the stomach, ghrelin does not go down. If you put glucose in the stomach, ghrelin does go down. That's kind of weird. Fructose does not get trigger, does not trigger any form of ending of hunger. You end up eating more. So if anybody wants all the biochemistry, we don't have time for all of it today, there's a YouTube video called Sugar the Bitter Truth that currently has 3.5 million hits. All you have to do is go on YouTube and, uh, and it'll go through all the biochemistry in exhausting detail. So I'm not going to do that for you today. I'm just going to point out the salient features of what's going on. Let's consume 120 calories <coughs> in glucose. Half a cup of rice, two slices of white bread. Everybody got that? Glucose. What happens to those 120 calories? 96 of those calories will be metabolized by all the organs in the body because every organ in the body can metabolize glucose. Every cell on the planet can metabolize glucose for energy. Every organism on the planet uses glucose for energy. It is the energy of life. And we can turn glucose into neat things like sialic acid, like Dr. Bertosi talked to you about several months ago. Only 24 calories, 20% of the total, will hit the liver. So let's see what happens to those 20%. Most of it goes right here to glycogen, liver starch. And liver starch is good. Liver starch is a readily available source of stored energy. Liver starch, glycogen, is what you're trying to build when you're a marathoner and you carb load before a marathon. We have kids with glycogen storage disease type 1A, Von Gierke's disease, where they can't fish the glycogen out of their liver. Their livers are down to their knees because they are filled with glycogen. They are stuffed with glycogen. They're hypoglycemic low blood sugar, like all get out. They are sick kids, but they don't get liver failure because glycogen is a non-toxic storage form of glucose in the liver. This is what your liver wants to do with energy. It wants to make glycogen. And the majority of the glucose that hits the liver will get turned into glycogen. Everybody got that? Now, a little bit will make it down through the Emden-Meyerhoff or glycolytic pathway down to pyruvate will enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle and get turned into energy here, ATP. And very little uh, of that will get thrown out via citrate, via a process called the citrate shuttle, and will get built up into free fatty acids, this process here called de novo lipogenesis, new fat making. This is how your liver turns carbohydrate into fat. And then that little bit will get exported as something called VLDL, very low density lipoprotein which you can measure in your triglycerides in your blood. And then that will go to your uh, fat cells and will get stored as triglyceride, and that can cause some weight gain. So can carbohydrate cause weight gain? The answer is yeah. 
but not much. Everybody see that? Because most of the glucose went to the rest of the body for burning because all the organs use it. Only a little bit will get turned into fat for storage. Now let's talk about a different carbohydrate. My favorite carbohydrate, and hopefully no one in this room is yet, but you know, college is coming. Okay? Alcohol, it's a carbohydrate, right? There it is, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but you know what? Alcohol is also a toxin, right? It's not one toxin, it's two toxins, right? It's a cute toxin, you wrap your car around a tree, and it's a chronic toxin, you fry your liver. Two toxins in one, toxic and abused. And we keep it out of the hands of children, very specifically, and for good reasons, right? Okay, let's talk about alcohol. Here's acute alcohol exposure, okay? You all have college to look forward to, okay? Be careful, okay? Now, notice fructose on the right side. Acute fructose exposure, none of those things, because the brain does not metabolize fructose. It does metabolize alcohol. So let's talk about alcohol. Let's consume 120 calories in alcohol. <clears throat> Shot of scotch, okay? Everybody got that? Before, it was two slices of white bread, now it's a shot of scotch. Both 120 calories. Equicaloric, but not equimetabolic, because a calorie is not a calorie. So let's follow those 120 calories in scotch. Where do they go? 96 will hit the liver. Only 24, 10, 20 percent of it, will get metabolized by other organs. Exactly the opposite of glucose. Remember, with glucose it was 2080, now it's 8020. So the liver has to now bear a greater burden of metabolism. And what happens to that alcohol? You see glycogen anywhere? No glycogen. Doesn't go to glycogen. Where does it go? Comes straight down here to the mitochondria. And it stops at several places that cause toxicity. These ROSs, reactive oxygen species, also known as oxidative stress, this is the aging process. This is why alcohol kills you is because it makes more reactive oxygen species. And anything that makes more reactive oxygen species is going to make you sick. And it comes down here to the mitochondria, which then are overwhelmed because there's so much alcohol coming down that you throw off a lot of citrate, and so you get big VLDL, and so you end up with hypertriglyceridemia in the bloodstream. You end up with lipid droplets in the liver because you can't export all of it out, and so some of it sticks, and so now you got fatty liver disease. Okay? And we also know that alcohol influences the brain to make you drink more alcohol, right? It's called addiction. So now we have a problem of overconsumption and disease. Now, would anybody like to tell me that that's behavior? Yes, no? Is it behavior? We'll talk about it. Now let's do fructose. So let's consume 120 calories in sucrose, okay? Eight ounces of orange juice. So two slices of white bread, shot of scotch, eight ounces of orange juice, 120 calories, all of them, right? But not metabolized the same. So let's look at fructose. So the glucose will do the same 2080 split it did before. So there's 12 and 48. The 48 for the rest of the body, the 12 for the liver. But only the liver has the fructose transporter. Only the liver has the GLUT5 transporter that allows fructose to enter the cell. So let's follow what happens to that fructose. You see glycogen anywhere? Nope, no glycogen. Comes all the way down here <coughs> to the mitochondria, does the same thing the alcohol does, makes that fat, lipid droplet, also makes your uh, insulin receptor not work through this process over here, makes insulin resistance, which is the signal feature of all of these chronic metabolic diseases that I've talked about. The fatty liver disease, the diabetes, the dementia, all starts right there at liver insulin resistance. Causes the hypertriglyceridemia, you have to export the VLDL out, that's obesity, and we also have learned that the higher your insulin goes, the less well your brain senses your at level of adiposity through a hormone called leptin. And so by upping your insulin, fructose causes you to be hungrier. And so you eat more, okay? 
This is a problem. So now what we have is consumption and disease, just like we had with alcohol. So here's chronic alcohol exposure. Just list down the, down the list in terms of uh, diseases. And here's chronic fructose exposure, 8 out of 12, because they are metabolized the same. And it makes sense that they should be metabolized the same, <clears throat> because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called wine. We do it in Napa and Sonoma every day. The big difference between alcohol and fructose is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step called glycolysis. For fructose, we do our own first step. But after that, what hits the mitochondria are, is exactly the same and causes the same diseases. This is mitochondrial overload. And any substance that overloads the mitochondria will cause these diseases. Now, fructose is not the only one. There are several. Alcohol is another. Trans fats is another. And we know those are bad. And the last one is branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. They are also metabolized by the liver straight to the mitochondria with no glycogen pop-off valve. And they cause the same problems when they're overconsumed as well. Who overconsumes those? Bodybuilders. That's one of the ways they make extra muscle is with branch chain amino acids. And that's fine if you're building muscle, but it's not fine if you're not. So be careful about those protein powders if you're not in active muscle building mode. So here's the, what's the difference? We got a can of Coke, we got a can of beer. Both 150 calories. Different, uh, different compositions, of course, 75 fructose, 75 glucose over here. 90, 90 calories alcohol, 60 maltose, that's glucose over there. The liver does, the, uh, there's a first pass metabolism effect on 10% of the alcohol. So the number of calories hitting the liver are exactly the same. So in America, we have this thing called beer belly. Well, guess what? We also have soda belly, because they're the same. They're exactly the same, because they do the exact same thing. They're handled the exact same way cause the same problems. OK. This is the fun part. I love this part. Here are the 10 most obese states in the nation. Here are the 10 laziest states in the nation. What's going on over there in Nevada? I guess you can only burn so much energy going like that. <laughs> now they just go like that. <laughs> yes, all red states, too. Yes, there's a, and there's a reason for that. Here are the 10 most unhappy states in the nation. <laughs> what do you notice? If you're fat and lazy, you're pretty unhappy. All right, good. All right, here's the adult diabetes rate. Here's the adult heart disease rate. And finally, here's soda per capita consumption. What do you see? So this is called Correlation. Now, correlation is not causation. That's true. Let's talk about the world now. Here's the global consumption of sugar and sugar crops per day. Here's us. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here's the rest of the world. The American Heart Association says 150 to 200 calories in added sugar. That's this color here. Take a look at the rest of the world. Where are they? Everybody's over it. And what is everybody seeing? Everybody's seeing a rise in obesity, a rise in chronic metabolic disease, a rise in diabetes, rise in heart disease, et cetera. Why? Well, I think we know why. Here is world sugar consumption tripling over the last 50 years. <clears throat> this is per capita consumption. Look at Brazil. Brazil used to be just a sugar exporter because its populace was too poor to purchase the sugar it was exporting. But now, Brazil is a BRIC country, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, right? They now have some money. They have an economy. And so they can now afford sugar. And now Brazil has the highest rate of increase in prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the world. Now, they don't have the highest prevalence. Who has the highest prevalence? Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Malaysia. Now, how do they do that? No alcohol. No alcohol.
but they got soft drinks like they're going out of style. Why? Because it's hot, because the water supply is a question mark, and no alcohol. This is their reward, okay? So I can have a gin and tonic, but they have a Coke. And they now have the highest prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the world. This is a problem. Now, you'd say to me, Dr. Lessig, this is all correlation. And correlation is not causation. That's true. Correlation is not causation. But we have causation also. I'm going to show it to you now. This is a paper that we just published two months ago. What we did here, and this was actually done in part by a Berkeley undergrad named Paula Yaffe, who got her integrated um, uh, uh, health studies uh, BS from Berkeley and is now applying to medical school, uh, along with uh, my colleague Sanjay Basu, who is now at the Stanford Prevention Institute. And what we did was we took four databases and we melded them. The first database is called the Food and Agriculture Organization Statistics Database, the FAO. This is part of the World Health Organization. And what we had was, for the entire decade, 2000 to 2010, we had food supply per capita consumption. We had total calories, we had fruits excluding wine, oils, roots, tubers, pulses, nuts, and vegetables for fiber-containing foods, meat, cereals, and sugar, sugar crops, and sweeteners. Everybody got it? We then melded that with the International Diabetes Federation database for the decade to look at diabetes prevalence country by country. We then melded that with the World Bank Gross National Income Database to control for poverty, to control for urbanization, and to control for aging. We then also mel melded that with an NHANES database that controlled for physical activity. And we asked the question, what about the world's food supply predicts diabetes worldwide? That was the question. 204 countries, we had complete data for 154. It turned out the 50 were not different when we subjected it to an analysis. We did a lot of fancy statistics, and I'm not going to bore you with the statistics, but we took this to the mat. The people who developed this kind of uh, analysis is called an econometric analysis, won two Nobel Prizes for economics. This is how you predict how your stock market's going to crash, okay? Not that it works, but anyway. <laughs> um, bottom line, this gives us what we call causal inference. I'll show you why. And we controlled for everything we could control for. We controlled for gross domestic product, obesity, urbanization, um, aging, and physical activity. And we asked, what predicted the change in diabetes rates? So during that decade, diabetes rates rose from 5.5 to 7%. And here's the model. And you can see here, sugar, sugar, plus various controls, 0.87% for every 100 calories consumed as sugar. And this was adjusted for total calories. Total calories had no effect. No effect. Obesity had no effect. Got that? Control for obesity. Obesity had no effect. So you'd say, well, the sugar caused the obesity, the obesity caused the diabetes. No, it didn't. Because when you took obesity out of the equation, the sugar still worked, still uh, showed pr uh, increased prevalence of diabetes. And here's the adjusted association of sugar against diabetes prevalence worldwide over the decade. So here's what you need to know. If you consume 150 calories extra, total, your diabetes prevalence goes up by a total of 0.1%. <laughs> Nothing. Who cares? But if those 150 calories happen to be a can of soda, diabetes prevalence increased 11-fold by 1.1%. And we don't consume one soda. We consume two and a half. So that's 2.4%. The average, the, the prevalence of diabetes in America is 8.3%. So that means that 33% of all diabetes in America is explained by sugar and sugar alone. That's pretty bad. And uh, for the whole world, it's 25%. But in America, it's 33. This is the important part. These data meet the criteria for what we call causal medical inference. Causal medical inference. Not scientific proof, but causal medical inference. We have dose. We have duration. We have 
directionality, that is, those countries where sugar went up showed increasing diabetes, those countries where sugar went down showed decreasing diabetes prevalence, and we also have precedence. We showed that every, every country where when sugar went up, diabetes followed by three years. And every country where sugar went down, diabetes reduction followed by three years. That's absolutely essential for proving causation, is precedence. Something has to precede something to be causative, right? Proximate cause, the lawyers will tell you. So this leads us to this question of what do you need for proof? And this is an important question in all of science, not just for what I'm doing, but for all of you. If you're planning on going to science, you need to ask the question, how much proof do you need? So, of course, there's something called anecdotal data. That's garbage. <laughs> then there's something called correlation. We talked about correlation, but correlation is not causation. A lot of people think correlation is causation, and that's a big problem. And I do not talk about things where I, I don't have causative data. All right? And you need to be very wary, because that's what happens in the newspapers, that's what happens a lot in the medical literature, is association or correlation. You have to be very careful. Then there's this thing called causal medical inference, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then there's something called scientific proof, where you actually do an intervention, and you control for the intervention, and you show that only the intervention can explain the outcome. And that's considered the highest level of proof. Everybody got that? Now, scientific proof is great when you can get it. But the fact is, scientific proof is often hard to come by because it costs money, and sometimes doing those experiments are unethical. 90% of what we know about in medicine today is based on causal medical inference, not scientific proof. So causal medical inference is kind of important. So here's a question for you. Who here believes in global warming? Why? Got any proof? What do you got? You have causal inference is what you have. Now, is it good enough? Good enough is like policy. Depends on who you ask. Is it good enough for Washington? Not really, because otherwise we'd be doing something about it. Is it good enough for scientists? Scientists accept it, but Washington doesn't. How does that work? How about football trauma causing Alzheimer's? Who here believes that football trauma causes chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Yes, no. Come on. Only half of you? Is that right? Only half? The, the half that raised their hands. How do you know? You got proof? You have causal medical inference. How about tobacco causing lung cancer? Who believes that? Why? You got scientific proof? Has anybody done a study where you take naive patients and you randomize them into two groups and you let one group smoke and the other one not and you show lung cancer in the group that smoked and you don't show it in the group that didn't? We have data like that? No. So here we are 50 years after the Surgeon General told us that smoking caused lung cancer, and we still don't have scientific proof. And you know what? The tobacco industry would like you all to believe that we don't have enough information, that we need more research. But we finally called the question, and we finally said, you know what? We have enough. And you know why we said we had enough? Because we got the documents in 1994, and that led to the Master Settlement Agreement. That's what it took. It took the documents to show that they knew what they were doing. That's the only reason anything happened. And finally now, sugar causes diabetes. Now who here now believes that? Why? Did I give you scientific proof? How would we do that study? We'd have to take people who are completely sugar free, which nobody is, and we'd have to then expose them to a high sugar diet for the next 50 years, where we controlled how much they took in and knew how much they took in. Anybody think that's ethical? Anybody think that's even doable? Do you think we'll ever actually have scientific proof for that? 
We have animal models. They're useless because the food industry says, that's animals. They want it in humans. Do you think Washington's going to change on the basis of animal models? No, because we already have that. We already have causation in animals. This is the point. The question is, what level of proof do you need in order to actually change policy? And this is a concept that's very, very important for all of you in the audience to understand because you are the next generation of policy makers. Okay? You are our future. I am happy to talk to you because you need to get this. The food industry will always tell us we need more research. We need more research. Do you know what, why they say that? Because that's moving the goalpost. Because we'll never get there. That's their way of saying, ha ha, you screw you. Everybody got that? All right. You need to know what you need to know in order to make change. And I'm very clear about it. Let's go finish this up with addictive. This will be short. Junk food addiction may be clue to obesity, indeed. High calorie foods may be as addictive as cocaine or nicotine and could cause compulsive eating and obesity, according to a study. Obesity and reward. Look at all these books that are out for the lay public saying sugar is addictive. So why is it that Washington doesn't know that? If you look in the brain, this is the area of the brain that's called the reward center, the nucleus accumbens. And in the nucleus accumbens, there are dopamine receptors. Dopamine is the feel-good, pleasure, reward neurotransmitter. And dopamine receptors, when they get occupied, give you the feeling of reward, and that's why you wake up in the morning, and that's why you go seeking sugar, is to occupy those receptors. And there are lots of substances that will occupy those receptors and will cause dopamine to be released. Cocaine, amphetamine, nicotine, cannabis, alcohol, morphine, heroin, they all do the same thing. They're all reward generating. But notice, here's a cocaine brain. What happened to the receptors? Downregulated. That's the problem with all of these substances is dopamine downregulates its own receptor. And that's a phenomenon called tolerance. And if you have tolerance and withdrawal, what do you have? You have addiction. That's what constitutes addiction, tolerance and withdrawal. Well, there's tolerance right there. You're looking at the neuroimaging correlate of tolerance. Well, here's a control brain and here's an obese brain. What do you see? Same thing. Not as bad, but same concept. So does sugar cause addiction? In animals, slam dunk, we got the data. Here are the four criteria for animals and addiction. Binging, withdrawal, craving, cross-sensitization with other drugs of abuse, meaning you expose an animal to one drug for three weeks, get them addicted. Then you expose them to another drug that they've never seen before, and they're addicted to that one too because the dopamine receptors are downregulated, and it doesn't matter which drug did it. And Oprah talked about this all the time, about addiction transfer. That's why when people stop smoking, they start eating, is because they need that dopamine reward and they have to generate more dopamine to occupy fewer receptors, and that means that they start eating. Anybody see this movie? Oh, good. As far as I'm concerned, if we showed this to every second grader in America, maybe we would actually solve the obesity epidemic. So the question is, is fast food addictive. We wrote a paper on this just two, two years ago. Take a look at this. This is really kind of fun. This is from 1972. Federal Trade Commission versus Sugar Information, 1972. The fat time of day. You're really hungry and ready to eat two of everything. Here's how sugar can help. They actually passed sugar off as a weight loss aid back in 1972 based, of course, on no data. How about this? <laughs> Why, we have the youngest customers in the business. Nobody does it like 7up. Now, obviously, this would never be allowed today. But you can see that you've all been marketed to. Right? Marketing to children is a big issue. How about this one? Drinks are on us. Publix is rewarding top grades with free apple juice and soda. Students, we salute your thirst for knowledge. 
The next time anybody offers you a soda for doing something good, say, just say no, okay? <laughs> American Heart Association gets it. And I'm very proud to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Bay Area American Heart Association because they get it. This was a paper we put out, Dietary Sugars and Cardiovascular Health, that we put out in 2009. And we recommended reduction from 22 teaspoons a day, average for America, down to nine for males and six for females. That's a reduction by two-thirds to three-quarters in order to improve heart health and to improve diabetes. Here's the problem. Who's winning this war? What's good for the food industry is bad for you. What's good for you is bad for them. There's no middle ground. This is a war, and you don't even know you're fighting. This is the Standard & Poor 500 right here over the last five years. And you can see here's the economic downturn of 2008 right over here, October 2008. And here's the stock price for McDonald's, Coke, and Pepsi during that same period of time. What do you see? They're doing very well, thank you. Here's ConAgra, General Mills, Hormel, Kraft, Procter & Gamble, Archer Daniels, all doing better than the S&P. Want to make money? Invest in a food company because they've got a product that is toxic and addictive. And they know it. And they're doing it. And it's legal today. So what I'm going to leave you with is this notion that you've got it all wrong. And I'm hoping that you'll at least see things maybe my way. That there's another way to interpret the first law of thermodynamics. And when you do, everything makes sense. Here it is. If you're going to store it, that is an obligate weight gain set up by biochemical and neural endocrine forces beyond your control, and you expect to burn it, that is normal energy expenditure for normal quality of life because energy expenditure and quality of life are the same thing. Things that make your energy expenditure go up make you feel good. For instance, ephedrine off the market, caffeine for two hours, exercise. Things that make your energy expenditure go down make you feel lousy, like hypothyroidism, starvation. So if you're going to store it and you expect to burn it, then you're going to have to eat it. In other words, the gluttony and the sloth are secondary to a biochemical process. The behavior is secondary to the biochemistry. And the biochemistry of sugar, fructose, the sweet stuff drives these processes that then cause you to under uh, burn and over consume, driving all of these chronic metabolic diseases. This is a very different way of thinking about things. And if you understand that, then you'll understand what's going on. And maybe we can actually do something about it. The two aberrant behaviors are a result of our biochemistry. Our biochemistry is a result of our environment. Change the environment, change the disease. So my question to you, your homework for today, two questions. Can our toxic environment of Kelly Brownell be changed without governmental or societal intervention, especially if there are potentially addictive substances involved? Every addictive substance has required personal intervention, which for lack of a better word we can call rehab, and societal intervention, which for lack of a better word we can call laws. Rehab and laws, rehab and laws for tobacco, for alcohol, for nicotine, for cocaine, for cannabis, for heroin. You name it, rehab and laws. For sugar, nada. And that's on purpose because they don't want rehab and laws because they're making money hand over fist. Question number two, can we afford to wait to enact some form of public health measure? when healthcare will be bankrupt in 2024 due to chronic metabolic disease such as diabetes, which we now have causal medical inference as to what to do. So the question is, do we have enough proof? Do we have enough proof to act? Should we change policy now before healthcare is completely broken? For further reading, lots and lots of peer-reviewed articles in the medical literature 
and more peer-reviewed articles in the medical literature, and more peer-reviewed articles in the medical literature, and more peer-reviewed articles in the medical literature. And I'll give Dr. Alper a list of all of these, and you can access all of these um, uh, uh, online uh, if you'd like. And also, some non-medical literature, a popular book that came out four months ago, Fat Chance Beating the Odds Against Sugar Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease, written for your friends, written for your family members, written for politicians in order to try to fix the problem. And with that, I want to thank all of you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.